So welcome to the ACLS annual meeting. Once again, I'm Joy Connolly, honored to serve as president of ACLS and very happy to see you all here. And if I'm saying that uh, for the third or fourth time to you, uh, just know that the repetition means an amplification of excitement. Honestly, it's, uh, it, it is really good to see everybody in person after two annual meetings where I was seeing you all on uh, the Hollywood squares of my, uh, my computer. So thank you all for coming. Uh, today, I know that you have a report of last year's activities in your, uh, in your meeting notebook. So I'm not going to review uh, the activities section by section, since I'll assume you would have read that. And instead, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you um, about our views at ACLS on change and evolution in academia, but particularly in the humanities and interpretive social sciences, and share some of our thinking about why why we think change is so urgent and the kinds of directions we're going in. I know that some of this work is well known to some of you and some of it is known slightly just to many of you, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that this review, uh, which will also allow time for questions and discussion will be useful for everyone, regardless of your, your familiarity or lack of familiarity with what we're doing right now uh, in terms of uh, of change in the humanities and social sciences. So, so first, an extremely brief reminder, because I, I am occasionally uh, brought to face to face as I talk with different members of different constituencies with the fact that not all of you always know what the other constituencies are up to or know about ACLS's work in, in, in our different sectors. So, um, so if you forgive me for a, a little bit of alliteration, we work with uh, with different groups, with schools, with scholars, with societies, and with the system of higher education. Although I always think when I use that word of John Kutzko's wonderful phrase or comment a couple of years ago that, that higher education is a systemless system. I think that's, I'm quoting John correctly. He can correct me if I got that wrong. Uh, but first our work with scholars, you were just here, many of you at the, the fellowship, uh, the fellows, excuse me, and scholars panel, uh, earlier today, earlier this morning, you know we have been distributing about $25 million per year in recent years in fellowships and grants. I also want to underscore um, in both U.S. programs and international programs and in my office uh, and, and in uh, James Shulman's, the vice president's office, the extensive work that goes on behind the scenes, not just administering the competitions, but offering e extensive support uh, to scholars, professional development, design, uh, excuse me, dissertation and manuscript workshops, cohort building, professional advice. It's an extraordinary amount of energy and time that staff expend on scholars um, and ap applicants as well as winners of our fellowships. Secondly, best known probably to most people in this room, 78 learned society members, and we are diversifying to include more members, which is a priority for us in this coming year. In particular, we hope to uh, recruit and bring in um, more uh, societies working in interdisciplinary ar areas and ethnic studies where um, we think we could use a boost. Um, thirdly, I think you also probably all know we have consortium, uh, um, ACLS Research University Consortium now with 41 members uh, across the country and about 225 associated schools. And then lastly, our system work, and this will be the focus for the rest of my comments today. In system, system of higher education, in my view, it's really a, a, a shorthand for change acceleration because we see our role at ACLS not as inventing great ideas or bringing about change you know, from our perch I would say at 633 Third Avenue, but I have to say now apartments scattered all over uh, the Amtrak Eastern Seaboard, but, uh, but rather connecting people uh, and, and, and accelerating and amplifying change because it's happening all around us uh, and many of you in this room are leading it. So a few examples of, of, of the context in which we're trying to do this. Um, you, you, many of you would have heard about our work in the design workshop for a new academy earlier this morning. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later as I will about these other things. The Mellon Intention Foundry is a second effort uh, very much engaged with, with learned society leadership and emerging scholars of color. And then thirdly, a new initiative for which we just received Mellon, uh, funding from the Mellon Foundation this year by way of a pilot 
um, called LENA because we like acronyms. Um, it's the, uh, going hand in hand with the loose funded design workshop for a new academy. This is the leadership institute for a new academy. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, but the last point I wanna make before I launch into my comments about change is, is to remind you that, uh, that like many of you in this room, we at ACLS are privileged and, and really pleased and, and intrigued and always uh, stimulated by the conversations we have across the country with graduate students, uh, with, with emerging scholars, recent PhDs, uh, with faculty, with administrators, with PhDs working outside the academy, with people hiring PhDs outside the academy. In short, a, a gigantic number of inputs that are informing the way we think about the state of the humanities and social sciences and really considerably affecting our, uh, our sense of how we can best work to strengthen humanistic scholarship. Um, now, and I, again, I, I really wanna emphasize this point in case you think we've all fallen victim to some kind of Messiah context. We are very well aware, or co complex rather. We, we know we're just one group uh, from, from the NHA to the SSRC and, and many other groups. There, uh, there are partner groups like us. And, and again, part of our mission is to connect uh, with them and work together in collaboration um, in our broadly aligned missions. So I wanna talk about the conditions in, in the US uh, as they look to us with all these inputs today. Uh, but I'm not going to jump straight into data uh, about, say, undergraduate enrollment or the job market, because while I feel a great temptation to do that, being kind of practically minded uh, often in my day-to-day -day work, I think to start there would really be to ignore the centrally important question, the crucially important question that provides the necessary conceptual frame for any meaningful discussion about the conditions of the humanities and social sciences uh, in the U.S. today. And you've all thought about this question uh, in, in many different ways over the years, I know. And that's what is the role of the humanities and interpretive social sciences in the university today? Now, and this is in the university. I'm not talking about society or the world right now. I'm really trying to focus on academic production, scholarly work. There are so many ways to come at this question. But among all of them, I've decided for reasons that will become clear, I hope, uh, to follow the prompt of Bill Redding's 1994 book, uh, The University in Ruins, which many of you may know. Uh, Redding's argued that in the early 19th and 20th centuries, uh, the university, and he refers to it with a capital U, he really means the North American Research University, had a clear mission. It was to uphold the cultural fabric of the modern nation. And he did include, and I, I wanna say this, uh, by, by way of acknowledging people in the room who are not in um, American research universities, he did include uh, liberal arts colleges, um, the you know, many different kinds of institutions in, in especially state systems that don't define themselves as a research university. One of the threads running through his book is, and it's something we think about all the time at ACLS, is how the values of the research university and its reward system and its internal metrics um, sometimes quite perniciously and sometimes inspiringly permeate the system in ways, the whole system, uh, our systemless system, in ways that make that uh, make it a good place to start um, because it is a shared reference point, even if it's not the shared experience of everyone in the academy. So I want to make that very explicit as I talk about the university. Um, it doesn't mean I don't have in mind and that we don't have in mind at ACLS um, the, the, uh, the many kinds of institutional expressions of scholarship that live outside the research university. This is just, again, we have to find one way in to these complicated questions, and I want to be transparent about mine. So if the, if the uh, mission of the research of the, excuse me, the university, including uh, to, to different degrees, all these other institutions was to uphold the fabric of the modern nation. And that means, Redding was saying that the university was the producer and the protector and inculcation, inculcator of national culture. And in, in the 19th century and early 20th century, really in the Arnoldian sense of the world, you know, culture as the best that has been thought and said. Um, but by the late 20th century, of course, radical changes, globalization in particular on the level of the nation and the corporation and the academy. So universities and colleges started to recruit students and faculty from all over the world. And this is just one of the factors, this globalizing um, shift that occurred after World War II that made the, that historical national mission of the university no longer tenable. 
And Redding says, makes this very clear that the place of the humanities and interpretive social sciences became especially precarious because our nation-based departments of literature and culture uh, and, and our self-definitions disciplinarily uh, made us central to that old mission, but what were we supposed to do in the new system? And this is what Redding's quite scathingly calls the world of producing excellence. Um, and it's not, not clear, he said, what the mission is in this new world. Now, Reddings, and I wonder if some people in this room might, might have known him or known of him, I and mean, he was tragically killed in a, a plane crash before he could finish his book. I don't think he was even 35. But um, the final chapters of the book call on readers to confront the consequences of globalization. And Reddings was under no illusion, and neither am I, and neither is anyone involved with ACLS, that this would be easy. Reddings wrote, an order of knowledge and an institutional structure are breaking down, and in their place comes the discourse of excellence that tells teachers and students simply not to worry about things, how things fit together, since that's not their problem. All they have to do is get on with doing what they've always done, and the general question of integration will be resolved by the administration with the help of grids that chart the achievement of goals and achieving excellence, whatever that might be. So to take responsibility, responsibility for devising a new mission instead of leaving it to co corporate or quasi-corporate powers, he said, meant constructing a new shifting disciplinary structure that moves beyond custom and nostalgia. And I quote one more time, to think the social bond without recourse to a unifying idea, whether of culture or the state. A Redding's fear that administrative powers and priorities would shape the university had sadly come true at many schools where changes in departmental structure and curriculum have been driven by budget rather than academic mission or intellectual reasoning. And I share his worry about the loss of a guiding mission to the humanities and social sciences that's meaningful to increasingly diverse faculty and students and administrators and the public. And I share his belief that faculty and students must take on this responsibility, even if they're not feeling the direct pinch of reduction in cuts. But I do agree with him, uh, but I do, excuse me, Freudian slip, I disagree with him. Let me underline that again. I disagree with him strongly in wanting to do this work without recourse to a unifying idea. And Redding says in a kind of post-structuralist mode, we're past unifying ideas. Um, we, we, can't, uh, we can't use those. And I, I do disagree. I think there's one unifying idea we can rescue. And that explains the quotes in the middle of your table that we've left for you. It's the world itself, the whole world. And this thought um, is expressed here best by Hannah Arendt. I'm just gonna read it out loud. In her essay, Introduction into Politics, Arendt wasn't talking about higher education, but her wor words are useful nonetheless. She said, if someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, he can do so only by understanding it as something that's shared by many people, lies between them, separates and links them, showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people talk about it and exchange their opinions and perspectives with one another over against one another. And now I'm having that moment of insecurity thinking that is the quote you have in front of you, isn't it? <laughs> Excellent, I was sure it was, wanted to check. So Arendt is talking here about world making, the creation of a shared world of, of thought and creativity and experiment and common purpose. The place where exchange is key to democratic politics can happen and where the individuality of human beings is made visible and their value as individual human beings is thus preserved. Arendt saw the purpose of the university as enabling this world making because it convenes people around the activity of talking together about texts or ideas or works of art or historical events. For Arendt to stop thinking, to become thoughtless, uh, something she writes about a lot, as she believed Nazis like Adolf Eichmann became thoughtless, is to lose the world. And this means losing the public space we humans hold in common. But to think and to be thoughtful is to keep building and keep preserving the plural world of human affairs. Arendt took from Kant the, the conviction that thinking allows us to handle human unpredictability and plurality because it leads to the enlargement of the mind, increasing the thinker's ability to understand the world from different perspectives and to form good judgments on the basis of that understanding. So she enjoined educators to teach not how to live the good life. And I think this lesson is so important for us to think about today in, in, a, in a world where people, people are becoming 
where moral prescription, I'll say, has entered academia in, in ways I think we need to think a lot more carefully about. Arendt said, we, we can't teach students how to live the good life. We can't teach morals. We shouldn't teach belief systems. We should rather teach, to use her phrase, what the world is like and how to talk about it. This education, she thought, would make students world builders in love with the world and also her phrase, committed to repairing and renewing it. So I survey the, the promise of this high purpose that Arendt um, articulates, I, I think, so eloquently uh, against Bill Redding's story about mission loss. And I haven't even gotten to the precari precarity data yet that will come. Um, but I come back to our disciplinary structure and our scholarly habits, and I ask, and, and I ask with my colleagues and I ask with many of you, are they sufficient to match the needs of the world today? I mean, so far well-funded institutions have decided to stick with the national and linguistic divisions of languages and literatures and histories. Many underfunded ones have gone global, making departments of world literature and world culture and humanities and social sciences. But again, they tend to be driven by dollars rather than intellectual mission. And I say this with respect for for schools and, and places where this is not the case. I know there are some cases like this, but in general, when you talk to faculty uh, who are in schools where there have been uh, made, uh, where, where departments have been created by, um, by bringing departments together into, into large conglomerate departments, they will tell you it's a, it's a dollar story, not a thought one. But meanwhile, our world is getting smaller because of technology and easy travel and you know, economic and academic globalization, as I just mentioned, especially as groups historically separated by space come into closer and closer contact with one another. And unfortunately, conflict is often the result. The, world, the work, it seems to me, that most urgently needs to be done is the work of bridging national and linguistic and cultural and religious divides. And building that into the way we group ourselves and design curricula would mean giving equal time and energy to preserving the specificity of human experience and the groups peoples have formed over time, and that's our current mode, and also, again, equal time to connecting, to communicating, to comparing, contrasting, and mutually understanding the results of our studies in their global context. And I know many of us are doing that. That's, that's a good thing. I, that's the trend I believe we should accelerate. So let, let's, let me sit, let, let that sit for a, a little bit and, and think for a couple of minutes in a more focused way along a different vector about the scholarship that humanists and social scientists do. And now I'm gonna use a smaller picture than the whole planet. Think about humanistic scholarship as a house. The foundations get laid, the first walls get built by scholars now in our disciplines of past generations. Time passes, scholars add onto it, the house gets bigger over time and it stops being a place for people to live and becomes a thing of beauty that we preserve for its own sake. It's a good thing. We paint it, we decorate it, we build porches and parapets, we see how high we can build our towers and how precise we can make the ornamentation because we can. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a good thing. But at the end of the day, the house of humanistic scholarship does have to be a place where people can live. I think one of the most exciting developments in the humanities and social sciences over the past 30 years or so is the way scholars have been treating the action of inviting more people into the house. Uh, and I think back to when I was a graduate student in this very city in the 1990s at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think there and, and many places and many fields, not just my own, the model was very well intentioned, but it pretty much amounted to this. We opened the doors, wider and we let, we welcome people in. We don't just let them come in, we welcome different people in. And now that paradigm I think has really changed for the better. We've begun to understand, I think, when you open the doors wide enough, when you throw open the windows and the, and the chimneys, you find you really need to redesign the whole house from the ground up. So from a house you know, where we, we were pushing open the doors, we're moving to something different, I think, um, different models for different disciplines, maybe a stoa or a hutong or even a cleared field marked maybe by movable boundary stones. Although I have to say when I was talking to a bunch of graduate students about this image, they said, no, no, not the field because we need some protection, we need a roof. <laughs> So um, just to stick with this point in terms of what's going on in that stoa or in that cleared field or hutong or, um, or whatever structure you wanna have in mind as you think about the house of, of humanistic scholarship. 
Um, what happens in it? Well, we've seen now for some decades, and you saw it vividly and, and wonderfully just now in the panel before lunch uh, when our uh, scholars presented to us, I, I want to pull out four new directions in humanistic scholarship that I think really amount together to a quiet revolution and not so quiet if you've been in the fields where they've been uh, the topic of, of debate. And, but they make imagining humanistic scholarship in global terms a lot easier to do. First, scholars are exploring new, just new ways to circulate knowledge, including multimedia publications, graphic novels, team written essays, work that includes incorporates creative writing or memoir, the building of archives, the building of maps. So some of it is, you can see the range here, foundational, what we used to call basic research, maybe sometimes we still do, um, also first person, uh, personal voice uh, work, collaborative work, artistic work. All the new ways to circulate or, or manifold ways, I'll say, to circulate knowledge. Secondly, and I see this especially among the emerging generation of scholars, not just there, an uptick in scholar activism. For example, research on voter turnout that includes actually getting out the vote or research on environmental problems that incorporates community driven proposals. Uh, this work, as we again, as we saw in the in the panel just before lunch is often undertaken by teams of people, including students and faculty working in collaboration. And third, community-engaged research, where scholars work directly with many different people, speakers of indig indigenous languages, communities eager to understand their own pasts and who have a lot to contribute, um, everything to contribute to the working of, that, uh, of those projects, people trying to imagine a better world in their communities, which includes understanding their past more thoroughly, um, and also communities across disciplines and across professional schools uh, and, and schools of arts and science. And finally, and I know some of these categories uh, overlap, comparative and transnational and transregional scholarship, which frames questions at the margins or on the borders of states. And such projects compare, say, the I in a lyric poem written in Uzbekistan with one in Sao Paulo, or concepts of criminal justice in ancient Assyria and China, or economic developments in agrarian cultures across the global south. Now, one thing about these four directions I've laid out is that uh, you've, it's very difficult to conceive of them uh, being produced in their best possible form in isolation. They all involve acts of co-creation, of working in collaboration with others. Now, anyone who's done this work will tell you about its enormously generative effects, but they will also tell you they're often unpredictable, they're difficult to contain within the seminar, you know, all our academic units, the seminar timetable or the traditional disciplinary graduate seminar or the semester calendar or the funding of the department if it involves paying people who are from, from a community who are contributing and guiding, in fact, say the, uh, the production of public history. But all four of these directions too, and their, their emphasis on collaboration, on relationality, on context, on memory, they all have the potential and they often do also respond constructively to the critique of the European thought world made by scholars like the eminent theorist and critic Sylvia Winter, who points out, and I quote, that our present arrangements of knowledge were put in place in the 19th century to serve the interests of imperialist Europe. Now, scholars have been doing this work for decades, but for many reasons, much of it, work that's collaborative, work that's written in the vernacular or expresses itself in activity beyond peer-reviewed publications, it tends to run into problems when it encounters the rules and habits of the university as it's currently institutionalized. And this, really, given the real challenges right ahead of us, is a serious problem that deserves our close uh, collective attention. All these diverse inputs from all over the country, as I mentioned at the beginning, they all tell us that the four directions I just mentioned are not rewarded consistently as they deserve, that the path is just a lot smoother for tr traditional monographs and articles on more and more highly specialized topics. Many scholars too, particularly scholars of color and women and scholars who are first in their families to go to college, scholars from poor families, immigrant scholars, they will put this point a lot more bluntly than I just did. They will say, and I'm channeling conversations again that I've had over the last few years, that they feel pressured not only to produce ever more specialized knowledge, but to do so in isolation and in an artificial language that limits their audience and limits their impact. 
And worse, it demands that they assimilate themselves into structures designed to perpetuate worldviews in which they're marginal or excluded or devalued. And I just mentioned Sylvia Winter. I could cite the insights of Gayatri Spivak or Candace Chu, my old colleague at the Graduate Center, or Roderick Ferguson or Grace Hung. Um, that's just a few of the um, marquee scholars, um, you know, well known, who have been drawing this to our attention. So this is why one of the central reasons why we at ACLS and in our societies are working on how to accelerate acceptance of plurality in scholarship and in, uh, and in academic achievement and work more broadly. We're seeking a plural approach to defining what counts in the production and circulation of knowledge, one that takes seriously the goals of inclusive world-making and transformation on a global scale rather than uh, work that simply falls into neatly and advances the national and linguistic divisions of the world. So this means thinking differently about doctoral education, the requirements for tenure and promotion, the form scholarship is permitted to take, the shape of scholarly groupings in the university, what we choose to re reward in terms of faculty activity in the university. It means we're asking ourselves really tough questions about the rationale behind the ever higher value being placed on certain kinds of work while our undergraduate and public audiences diminish. And this is why ACLS last year applied for and won a three and a half million dollar grant from the NEH to support publicly engaged scholarship. And if you haven't uh, looked at our website to get a sense of the work that that, uh, that project is promoting, I hope you do. It echoes um, in spirit and in topic, many of the topics pursued by our and, and interests pursued by our uh, scholars in the Scholars and Society program, and indeed um, other uh, ACLS fellowship winners. Um, and I'll mention too, this is the moment where I loop back um, the, the, intent, the Mellon Intention Foundry, of which many of you um, are participants. This is bringing scholarly society directors together in a mix of online, um, very intensive workshops. And now, thank God, this year in person, uh, in Chicago and New York, in person workshops. Um, this is, if for those of you who have participated and who are waiting for, um, surely not with bated breath, given everything else you have to do, but you're, you are waiting, I know, for us to come back um, and engage you in the report back process. For those of you who are in the Intention Foundry this year, for those of you who will be in it next year, this will be, and I have very much in mind my conversation with, um, with uh, Director Phil Harper of the Mellon Foundation last night, this will be a wonderful way to help the Mellon Foundation learn about our work together to advance diversity and equity in the Academy, um, and not just Mellon, many other partners as well. Our design workshop for a new academy is another attempt to accelerate change. And you heard about that this morning. So I won't uh, say more about it other than to say we're here if you have more questions or comments or critiques. And thirdly, and lastly, I wanna mention uh, for a little bit, uh, with a little more detail, our new initiative, LENA, the Leadership Institute for a New Academy. We'll roll this out uh, next summer. In another summer institute, so we'll be kept busy with this activity 12 months a year. Um, this first pilot year will bring in um, sitting deans for humanities or arts and sciences or recent deans. And the idea here is to equip, um, arm, if I can use the military metaphor, these deans and recent deans with tactics and strategies and tools from, from better understanding of university budgets to tactical understanding of how university hierarchies work so that these people can go out and advocate, fight for uh, the humanities and social sciences, and indeed fight for more territory than we have now. And we flip the narrative of preservation and defense again into growth and change. So now I'll be blunt in, as I come to a close because I do, as I said, wanna have time for questions and simply say, uh, kind of three things about some of the obstacles we see ahead. I mean, one obstacle to change in our discipline is, and I know you'll be generous with me and let me think through my thought, it's, it's ourselves, right? Because the arts and science professoriate and the people who support that, support that professoriate in this country is overwhelmingly white. 
overwhelmingly coming from better off and well-educated families. And overwhelmingly, and you may know this, this study from the University of Colorado, um, it, from families where parents have PhDs. So it's a very an internally looking group. Um, the second, uh, second challenge we see uh, in front of us, in, and again, you know this well, is the decline in, in majors and enrollments, and partly a problem because it affects so many different schools and fields in so many different ways. So it's very difficult to get our arms around the problem and think collectively about it. But it leads to the third problem, which is the decline, of course, in faculty hiring that's made the job market you know, such a horror for um, so many of our graduate students, our doctoral students finishing today. But the answer, in my view, is not to decrease the numbers of graduate students getting degrees, but to increase the number of students on the undergraduate side who need our teaching and who need our knowledge and who will benefit from it and help us spread it outside the walls of the academy. Because undergraduates should be flocking to our fields, that's our view. The good news is though, many faculty, many of you are trying to think different. If you don't mind me quoting the Apple ad, we are trying to reach more students and we do have the purpose of revitalizing the creation of knowledge by reframing its scope um, in many ways. So with that uh, in mind, I will simply end by saying this, that as I said at the beginning of the design workshop, we are trying to keep our eyes on the great purpose and promise of humanistic scholarship in the world. And this lends to grandiose language and claims and exhortations and, and aspiral, aspirational words. And those are good and we need them and we need to share our best words with each other in order to do this work together. But I know very well from my administrative experience uh, at NYU and the, and the CUNY Graduate Center that ideas, great ideas and eloquent language and extremely acute analyses of the problems are just not enough. We really need to think together about real world embodied processes and ways we can work together step by step in this multi-year, probably multi-generational project to change the world for the better, to make the academy a place where true new world making can happen. But talk should be a plural enterprise. I've tried to restrain myself, but I will now open it up to at least, uh, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So thank you very much. I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about ACLS's external relationships with other organizations in the higher education space, um, particularly on the STEM um, community, but, but you know, ACE. And I mean, because obviously we're not going to uh, change all of these huge questions you've put before us as this community, you know, here gathered today. And I, I'm just curious, like what, what the reception has been, what, what's going on that's sort of parallel, complementary, uh, or maybe even antagonistic in some ways, um, how you see this fitting in within the larger context? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's why I tried to emphasize our awareness that so much is going on and, and our desire to connect up with it. So just two things, uh, kind of two examples of our thinking on this and our action on this. In the design workshop, we started out with the plan um, that after these six, the initial work with the six teams that we did last spring and summer was over, that the next step, and we've been carrying this through bit by bit um, over the last year, would be to you know, get first gather, and this took about six months, just knowledge of what else is going on, um, whether it's uh, groups like ACE or AACNU um, or the AAU or the Council of Graduate Schools, and sorry for all the acronyms, but, um, but to, to find out what efforts were most aligned with ours, share them with the teams themselves, which we've now done, and then make some decisions about what kinds of groupings or networks we would seek to connect. Um, some of you might remember we had an event late this winter, um, an online event that featured many of the same people you saw today where they gave kind of initial presentations of their, of their uh, results. One of the things we did after that was we sent out a, um, uh, a very short, at least we hope, a short questionnaire asking people who attended the event or who'd signed up for it actually to identify themselves and say, I want to be involved at, at different levels. I want to get emails about this. I want to be invited to events or I want to actively participate. And we got an extraordinary number of responses back for people checking the most engaged box and saying, please get me involved. Um, so we're now in the process of, of forming those groups along the different clusters of 
transforming doctoral education, um, changing what counts for tenure and promotion in terms of scholarship, expanding our appreciation of what faculty do, et, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of linking, um, amplifying activity we're doing along with presentations. I've spoken to the graduate deans of the AAU and you know, kind of doing presentations like this, um, just sharing the knowledge that we're up to this. Uh, activity and asking, you know, how can we best connect? Um, on the um, on the STEM side, though, um, you've just identified an area where we need to do more work because we've started in our, you know, our domain. Uh, but the, you know, if we really are to design a new academy, this isn't going to just feature the humanities and social sciences. So I would add along with STEM uh, professional schools, and this is one area where because ACLS includes uh, connections with say with with law. Um, we hope to, to make real progress. I, I think one of the most promising uh, directions where students are really voting with their feet are those new degree programs or modified degree programs that allow students to um, put their you know, thirst for cultural or linguistic or philosophical or, um, or historical or what have you knowledge to work along with some exposure to policy, some exposure to you know, practical thinking about how to make the world a better place that's typically done really well and creatively in, in schools of public policy or schools of business or schools of law or, or public health. Um, so that's a whole area we, we need to continue working towards, uh, working in. Thanks. Thank you.